Good afternoon, Ashok sir. Good afternoon, Orvindo. Thank you so much for having me uh, on this little, uh, I, I want to call it a meeting of minds. Um, and I think it's really important that uh, we address these issues with the younger generation, the future architects as they were, uh, architects, designers, whatever they aspire to be. Um, from what I gather, it was a very interesting conversation in the morning with Anand. And he touched upon some of uh, you know the more the academic uh, part and theoretical part of what our industry is about. Um, I know it's post lunch; <laughs> we're all probably uh, a little wary. So I'm going to try and keep this as light and airy as possible, um, a little humor if possible. Um, and yes, and we'll we'll run through it. And I think Orbindo wanted me to uh, show some of the projects that we're working on. Uh, so I'm going to do that towards the um, end of the presentation. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to navigate through my presentation. So, Orvindo, please uh, help me out. My file is still saving in the background. I can still see that going on. Good. Yeah, I, I'll do it. You just tell me to turn the page, and I will keep turning the pages. All right. So let's let's move forward. Yeah. Uh, so just a quick, um, uh, who am I? Who are we? Um, uh, my name is Brinda. Uh, I'm an architect, designer, uh, dreamer, if you want to call me that. Uh, and I just love creating and I love, I love challenges. And, uh, and I work with a team of architects uh, who are all driven by the idea that we can create. And uh, that's, that's who we are. We are designers and we are dreamers. Um, I belong to a firm called Datakanan Partners. I think um, a little bit about us, I think, was already touched upon in the morning. So I'm just going to go ahead. We can go to the next slide. What do we do? Uh, we do a lot of things. Um, that's just some of the aspects that we cover in um, what we call our practice or our studio. So it's quite diverse. And I think that's what we really enjoy doing because we're able to touch many lives and um, many aspects of design and creation. Yes, please. But even though we can move forward, yeah. Uh, just some captures and some screenshots of what we do every day, uh, a little bit of uh, architecture design, and then the more um, the intense part of it where's, where there's mechanical engineering, there's um, electrical engineering. I think all, all of that is part and parcel of what we do. Uh, I think beautiful spaces need to be uh, supported by good design in terms of um, the services and the structure as well. So we also have to look at that, and we do. We still enjoy doing that. Yes, please. Uh, I think just again another slide on what we do. I think we can keep we can skip this one and go forward. These are just the types of projects that we do. So, uh, why am I showing you this? I think this is aimed at the students uh, to give them an idea of what you can do. It's not just uh, or even if you just go one slide up. Uh, you'll see that they're, they're actually quite uh, varied. I mean, we we go from designs to really small spaces where, uh, you know, the factors that you have to deal with are very different from very large scale projects. Um, there's a lot of transport design that we've done. So what I'm trying to get at is uh, when you do graduate and, you know, you are at a point where you want to think about what you want to do, I think uh, the possibilities are endless. Uh, so this just gives you an idea of what is there that you can do and where you and your your inputs will be valuable. So it's not it's which is later in the slide I'll talk about what I think architecture is, but this is just a preview and to make you understand these are the things that you can do as a designer when you do graduate and come out into the industry. Yes, please. Next slide. Uh, I'm just gonna skip right through this. Uh, I think Arundo just sort of went through this as well. Um, did my architecture from RB, we did my master's, and yes, now I am a practicing uh, architect designer. Now, this is what I want to talk about. What is architecture? What is what is it? It you know, we all say we're architects. So to me, it's threefold. It is an art form. I think a lot of us know that and we acknowledge that it is a form of art. We are artists, we are creators, we are designers. And why is that? Because like an artist, you have a black blank canvas. It could be a site, it could be a space, uh, it could be a sheet of paper. And the art that you create is 
what you think is the, the potential of that space or of that uh, you know the plot that is given to you and i think that's where the individuality of each and every one of us comes out and is portrayed uh, we all think very differently we are all cre very creatively inclined every single human being has what i think is called an aesthetic sense and we just i think uh, portray it or we apply it in different ways um, and i think as architects uh, what your your university and what your professors are doing is helping you to fine tune those and to help you express those in for in the form of you know your elevations your sections your 3d views but what they're trying to basically get you to do is to take those ideas and thoughts that are in your mind and express it in a form that's more acceptable, uh, which is why I think it's a science because it is the science of building. Uh, I think Mr. Berry was touching upon that in the, in the morning where you know he was talking about these cantilevers. Yes, dream big, you are a designer. So start there, I think start creating these spaces that are fantastic, create products that are fantastic. The next step is for you to be a scientist or to look at the science of building it that's where the technical aspect comes in and which is why uh, you know our structural engineers and all of our allies are very very important to us and we do not work alone we always work as a team we can't work without them um, we have their strengths they have theirs and then it's it, it's the last aspect of it uh, which is probably not the, the the best part of it but it is a, it is a profession I don't want to use the word the business or trade, though it is used very loosely. Um, I think even the word profession is sort of uh, wrongly applied. I still want to call myself an artist and not a profession. But if you look at the way the industry works, and you know, when you look at the mechanics of running your studio, yes, it, at the end of the day, you do have your responsibilities to your client, you have your responsibilities to yourself, to your studio, to society in general. Uh, this is where I think you become a professional, where you do need to follow the ethics of society, you need to follow rules and regulations, uh, and you have to be a professional. So that to me is what architecture is, and uh, that's what I think we would all be uh, dealing with when we come into the industry. And uh, I'm not sure if this is still being covered in, um, I think it was theory of architecture, if I'm not wrong. Um, why is architecture important? Um, I think for many, many more reasons than what we have actually listed here. Um, these are some of the things that we as a studio believe in. Um, helps you create a sense of space. Yes. I mean, I think that's just the basic premise of what architecture is. I think what's more important are points two, three, and four. It creates legacies. As architects, we create culture. We reflect the culture of the space that we live in, the time that we live in, and yes, Believe it or not, we do actually help creating traditions as well. Uh, point number four, I think we've all seen this uh, firsthand in you know the unfortunate events that have happened the last couple of months. We have this huge hold on how the economy works around us. Uh, we create economic opportunities. We define how it works. Um, you know, unfortunately, COVID had this really bad. Uh, a hold on what our industry was doing. Uh, yes, it was beyond what we we could have done. But I think there was this there was another parallel talk that happened uh, where prominent architects of Bangalore were involved, and we had this conversation where we said, "What is what can we as architects do, or beyond being good professionals and creating good design? How do we help uh, you know all of those who help us realize our dreams?" Uh, so that was another conversation that happened. A lot of them went out. Uh, IIA was involved. And we did a lot to help all of those who were displaced. A lot of those migrant workers um, needed our support. And as an industry, we did what we could. But I think what we need to remember is that we have a huge responsibility towards them. Um, and again, I think the last point is responsible architecture. I think responsible architecture, uh, again, is a very, 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 and a very uh, intense topic. Uh, that we can debate about uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, I think the one that is most spoken about is uh, the green architecture, what, how what we build today, um, how does it enrich lives, and what does it do to the environment around us? Um, we're all talking about green buildings, and uh, and I think uh, Berries does also look at uh, 
you know the uh, the green aspect of building in some of their projects so i think that's something that is an that's an ongoing discussion uh, and and i think compared to what where the west is or the other cultures are the india is still we still be in a very nascent stage and i think that really needs to be explored but uh, the good news is that we have joined uh, that momentum and uh, uh, and i think the future generation should look at it and study it uh, you know a lot more than uh, what's going on today uh just a very quick um slide this is again i think a uh, very uh, again a topic that can be discussed at length um how does it create how do you as an architect or as a designer create a sense of space um to us it's a, a bunch of things that come together uh, there's knowledge what is knowledge um if you look at that the little uh, orange balloon i think that's where most of you as students are today uh it's the knowledge that is being imparted to you it's the research that you do it's the data that you collect um it's the information that's available to you so it's that is knowledge right so you take that and then you have the biggest uh, aspect i think of becoming a good designer that's experience not just your experience of how you experience a space it's about you traveling you exploring and i think the more you travel the more you explore the more you meet people you know you experience cultures different cultures the more you learn about how do you make a place a space right there is a difference between the word place and space i mean they're very close but there's a huge difference in the way it's perceived so i i really would think that all of you should well i know it's not physically possible to travel at this point in time and maybe not in the near future but there is a lot of resources that's available um, on the internet there are a lot of books so please do go out there go into your library pick up books um, read read about culture read, read about traditions of different countries uh, different cultures read about what the west is doing the west is doing so much more uh, you know technologically uh the way ahead of us so when you start taking your knowledge that is being imparted to you at at beads and you know at what you what you read and what you see in books um expand on your experience and i think that is what is going to give you uh what you need to create the sense of place and space uh so i think it it needs to be it, it's you know this word that we use all rounded uh, i think that's what it is so uh what i'm trying to get at here is go out and explore uh observe what's there for you i think there's just so much today that um is available today to you guys than there was when you know i think when we were doing architecture so i think the idea is that all of you should go out there and take what you can and what's available to you please ask questions uh everybody around you has experienced and i think traveled and seen so always take what you can from people around you um and like i said at the end of the day it's your knowledge and it's your experience and that's what makes you um, a well rounded and wholesome uh, designer yeah just i think we wanted to you know we were talking about this in the studio and we said uh, you know i put this question out there and i said uh, it was sort of this fun thing that we did we said okay time problem i said uh, give me images you can't talk but give me images where architecture has created a legacy so this is what the studio came up with if you go to the next slide we said um uh, again where does where do you see architecture reflecting culture reflecting tradition so i think the impact that a designer or an architect i'm not here to discuss if these this is the right kind of architecture or to comment on the architecture but i think what we're trying to establish here is the immense responsibility that lies on our shoulders as designers um and these are some of the landmarks that you see every single day but these have all been created by architects right uh, if you go to the next slide i think we were talking about uh, uh, creating economic opportunities uh, so this is i think we've already spoken about uh, you know how we can help them and what is our responsibility towards them um, and i think the last one was um, talking about uh, the green and the responsible architecture if you go to the next slide uh, aurobindo if you can just slide over yeah so i think uh, responsible architecture like i said is i think it it's prob there's enough content i think for us to have a, a whole new uh, discussion but it's about how do you place a building in context um 
how do you respond to what's around you and how do you reduce your footprint and your uh, you know we're all talking i think a lot of you know about what what carbon footprint is and we're all talking green architecture why why are we taking all these steps uh, so i think that is what i mean there i think there's a whole uh, like i i think 10 other points as to how architecture can be responsible uh, but these are just a few things that uh, we thought that you know are the most most spoken about um, and the most obvious ones um, um, yes, yes uh, next slide so, so uh, someone uh, asked me someone this asked me in, um, in another um, conversation that we were having, uh, and I think it was an intern of mine who was, um, you know, she came in for an internship and then she said, um, so what do I need to do to be a successful architect? Um, so I said, uh, the, the perfect answer would be for you to write it down. You know, what do you think? So she came up with a few. Uh, and then we sat in the office and uh, there were a couple of architects that we sat down and we had this little conversation in the afternoon and we said, what does each one of us think we need to do? Uh, so these are the points that came out of it. Uh, passion. Uh, you know, I, I want to say uh, uh, Mr. Berry got, uh, was, was giving us this lovely uh, talk this morning. And, and I think what I took away from that was his passion. Uh, it's plain and simple. He's an extremely passionate person. And I think every one of us needs to have that that it, it you have to be passionate to do what you want to do or what you like to do and you need to do it really well uh, so passion in whatever you do um, patience extremely extremely important extremely extremely paramount in every aspect of your life you have to be patient for you to see the results of what you are investing in today uh, you know, I had a, a I had another architect who come in and said, uh, I spent five years uh, doing an architecture course, and when I graduated, I thought I was an architect. Uh, but now that I've started, uh, you know, working in an office, I realized I'm not. And you know, the, the thing that I uh, told him was exactly this: that you have to be patient. Don't look at it as, oh, I, I spent five years doing something, and I want the result today. You're not going to see it that way. I think it's like anything else in life. Um, you need to give it time. Uh, you need to absorb again and again. I'm going back to absorbing what's around you and and to take in and everybody's experience. So please be patient, uh, not just in your architecture course. I think you need to learn to be patient uh, when you get into the industry and when you're working on projects, when you're working with a team, when you're working with your clients. Uh, you will find that I think patience is a virtue. Uh, that will be very, very well uh, appreciated. Um, I think we all know you need to be creative. Uh, we all know, yes, huge, huge, huge problem solving is a huge thing. Um, that is something that's um, a definite. A very keen eye for detail. Now, that's something that we really, really do appreciate and we push for in our studio. Um, you, may be, you may be given a blank sheet and you know they may say uh, your time problem might be, um, um, I don't know, uh, maybe uh, Mr. Mendoza would say design uh, you know, a studio for uh, you know, for the for your semester seven or semester eight. Now, the eye for detail, or an architect with an eye for detail, would start with the smaller bits, right? It's always a question of do you do you zoom in or do you zoom out? So, to me, I think you should have the ability to zoom in and zoom out at every single point of time. Look at the entire picture. Uh, the nuts and bolts are as important as the bigger picture. So, at every point in time, I encourage my studio to zoom out. To look at the bigger picture and if they're doing a really large project i i encourage them to take a to take a break zoom in and look at the smaller pictures you have to work with it in tandem it cannot be worked on separately uh, so that's really really important and that's something that you can start working on as a student right now um number crunching of course it's all about numbers <laughs> uh, i'm sure all of you know that already um uh, business acumen, yeah, I think that's something that came up in the studio. But yes, you you need to know how to run a project. You need to know how to be smart on your feet. Uh, you need to know, well, we're in India, so you need to know how to haggle, uh, you know, with your vendor. Uh, you need to be able to get the fair price for your, uh, for your clients. So uh, yes, I guess that would mount to a uh, good business acumen. Um, a very, very open mind and a very young heart. Uh, I think I've... I've I personally know architects who are well into their 70s, uh, but they have the heart of like a 25 year old. And I think that's really critical to go to being what is point number one, passionate. Uh, so 
never leave i mean i think never lose the child in you and always again going back to being passionate and being young at heart um love to read that's something that's i think that's something that we really need to push with the younger generation uh there's so much material out there i i don't think we read enough um i don't know orbindo you can agree with me on this we read a little bit but i don't think we read enough of what was available uh, as a resource there's so much more available today but please all of you inculcate this habit of reading and when i say reading it's just not the theory of architecture uh, or uh, you know these large essays on architecture this you you know this goes back to my slides earlier when we were talking about uh, how do you create legacies how do you create a responsible architecture so read across genres uh, read the newspaper uh, read books on economy you get to learn so much about other aspects of what influences good architecture so please read um, in start cultivating their habit today uh, and like i said the the possibilities and the, the resources available are endless um, and what can you do you come out and you're a successful architect um, what are the things the things that you can be involved in uh, again i think it's uh, the possibilities are endless these are just some of the few things that uh, i would want you to you know even consider uh, don't limit yourself to these uh, many many more that i can think of uh, but i think what we, what we would love to see the future generation look at i think more in detail is urban planning we would love a lot of lot of you to go into restoration and conservation there aren't enough people doing that uh, that is a big thing in in india and with the resumi of our buildings that are uh, in disrepair so study these this is a good time for you guys to get in and research uh, these topics and uh, yes you are you do have time to get into all of these specialties but it is it is like i said read read, read about these um yes next slide please yeah i think you can skip this this just encapsulates the same thing ah uh, so now to lighten up the mood you know we've had all these uh, intense discussions in the morning and there's there's so much you know conversation that's happened uh, someone said you know i'm going to be an architect soon uh, what can i expect uh, so the next couple of slides i'm not going to talk uh, or even you can just run through them but they're just it it's just fun slides about the reality of what our industry is Arbindo sir please hold on like uh, please hold for a second I think some of them you're all very well aware of the long hours of work for sure and that doesn't change when you become an architect it doesn't stop at architecture school Yeah, I think you can go go ahead. Yeah, it's just fun. Uh, it's a couple of fun anecdotes that we put together. Uh, but I think the message is sort of loud and clear. This is what you can expect. uh just to wrap up i think uh, uh just a glimpse of some of the things that we are doing right now some of our recent works um again just to show you that you know you can influence so many uh, different aspects of you know uh, society around us uh, we were involved in designing uh, uh, two sections that is 11 stations of uh, the bangalore metro i have previously worked uh, i think as uh, orbindo has mentioned in the morning a couple of transport related projects out in the uk and in uh, the uae uh, so when i came back here they asked me to uh, now, you know uh, get into bmrc last me to get on the board and to help them design uh, some of the technical aspects of uh, nama metro so i was happy to do that spent a couple of years doing that with them um to so be actually were involved uh, technically with 11 of the stations in bangalore yes next one uh interiors is something that i'm really passionate about right now um 
you know, and, and I was like, I was talking to you how, uh, about how you zoom in and zoom out. I think uh, an Indian project gives you the perfect opportunity to do that uh, because the devil is in the detail. Uh, so Blown was one of those projects that came to us. Uh, this was the first one that I've showcased here, but we've done four over a period of, I think, three years. Um, one of the most difficult parts and one of the most difficult projects that was given to us, uh, it, it, technically extremely challenging, uh, extremely successful uh, as you know the first short, and then in a couple of like I said uh, over the last three years we've gone ahead and built four, and it's actually now a, a chain and it's doing uh, extremely extremely well. Yes, next one. Uh, high rise residential is, uh, it, I think we're not new to it as a concept, but uh, I think it, it was uh, something that we were very, very keen to work on, and we were very lucky to work with uh, one of our long term clients. Uh, this is uh, an ultra luxury project in uh, one of the, uh, in central, in the heart of Bangalore. Uh, the building is completed, as you can see. We've recently just given them a handover. Um, so, what, what I'm trying to show here is so the building is uh, very responsibly built. Responsibly built how in terms of the services that we've done uh, and how the building operates in the home and in the selection of materials. So when we talk about luxury, I think, I think it doesn't need to be uh, an all-out um, you know, effort of just uh, spending money uh, and, you know, and, and have making big statements. I think along with that, there is also the responsibility of making sure that the building lives a long life. Uh, so this is one of the projects that uh, we successfully delivered la uh, last year. Uh, this is something we're just wrapping up right now. Uh, it's in the heart of the city. Uh, it's called the Marquis. Uh, the Marquis sits actually uh, on uh, Vitra Road. Uh, it's an icon. Uh, the building is, again, very, very challenging in many ways. Uh, and I think we successfully uh, uh, overcome all of those. There are a lot of new technologies in the building. Uh, and yeah, yeah like you can do some Next one, please. I think you skipped one. Uh, I, Orban, I sent you a second one. Uh, I think uh, about an hour ago. Uh, I, I think uh, Mr. Manohar had asked me to just. Uh, talk about parametric architecture. So there was a project in which is currently on ground where we've done uh, uh, we've used some of the aspects of parametric architecture. So if you can just uh, open that up, I'll just run you through that project as well. Okay. Uh, I'll just have to download that. Uh, let me just see. No, I think mine is still still rendering in the background. One second. I'll, let me see if I can download it again. Oh, okay. I think it just the, the last two slides uh, have the new project on it. I got it. I, I just got it. Yeah, I, unfortunately, mine is still saving for some reason. I think the size of the file was really large. It's just uh, opening up. Uh, we can go straight, I think, to the last slide. Uh, the last but one slide, yes. Uh, yes. This, okay. One more up, please. The, the, the next one or this one? One, one before this. I'll just talk about the project and then you can just look at. So uh, uh, this is one of the projects that uh, is currently on um, the board in the studio. Um, I think we were talking uh, earlier this morning uh, and, you know, uh, he said uh, one of the aspects that, 
y'all were y'all were exploring in the studios was how technology is used and you know uh, looking at various aspects of parametric architecture uh we do have a studio called hybrid arc uh, we do we do use uh, uh you know various methodologies with working with parametric architecture it's something that it, it is an ongoing effort um started way back i think when we were in school and we were studying uh you know different softwares and different ways of arriving at solutions um so this is this is a product uh, of one of those uh, explorations that was done in the studio uh, so this is the final building uh, we are currently happy to see uh, it with ground and uh, we started construction so orvin if you go down to the next slide um this is an idea of how we create something you know a lot of you can see the many struggle on how to build uh, so this is this just gives you an idea of how the facade how the facade of uh, the idea to place and so we did a physical model first uh, once the concept was rendered and it was approved uh, and then we studied how the facades um, and the various angles worked out it was refined in a physical model first uh, and then we came down to using parametric architecture modeling and then you so uh, all the drawings that you see here were actually generated out of uh, i'm not sure uh, so are you guys doing any uh, softwares in this in their studio or uh, are they being exposed to any of these uh, softwares currently other than say 3d max uh we use uh, uh, we use sketchup and uh -huh. uh, lumion okay and so sketchup is not technically a uh, parametric architecture it's more surface modeling uh but so what what we uh, we so we do having said that we do use sketchup for other block models so this one in particular uh, so what we do is we explore depending on on the concept itself we use different softwares to sort of model it and to sort of get the best product out of uh, the software so that's where i think you use technology to help you achieve sort of goal that you're getting at so uh, we've used i think grasshopper was used towards the end but the modeling was actually completely done in rhino rhinoceros rhino uh, so where the building was conceptualized completely in the software and then it was then taken out the product of the model was taken out from rhino and was then taken into autocad and now the building is coming out of the ground with the help of uh, autocad uh, so this just goes to uh, i think explain to you that you know when when we go out there and we explore design uh, again i think it goes back to what sir was talking uh, mr berry was talking about in the morning you know you you dream big and then you take a step back and you look at the science scientific aspect of it and how to build so that's where i think we use uh, you know the software or the computer to assist us uh, there's another point that i want to touch touch upon that i i was really glad he brought up uh, you know he was talking about how you guys should use a pencil i couldn't be a bigger advocate of that so that's something that i uh, you know hone on every single day in the studio please do not use the computer or the software to design for you i think we've all been uh, uh with very very sharp brains and you know like he said the, the neurons go from here to here they don't go from here to the mouse so please use your hand uh to explore uh to draw uh to express your your ideas and then take that idea so so this building uh, uh i haven't put that slide in here but was actually conceptualized on a piece of butter paper uh so it went from there it went into the software from that software it went back into the paper where it was ironed out all the kinks were ironed out and then we figured out you know we got this the science team on board we got them to help us structure the building and then it went back into rhino when all the surface modeling was done and then the surface model was extracted taken back into our autocad and now the facade drawings are being given to the consultant to develop uh so i think i think technology is great but i think you need to know how to use it to its best potential um so you should definitely i think uh, i mean this is the future uh, which is what i was talking about and i think in the west they way ahead of us in terms of how uh, they use parametric design how they use hyperbole how do they uh, create surfaces i think we all we all know about zaha and come up some of the other uh, well known architects but there are very very small firms out there who are exploring uh, you know these new typologies of design and we were very very happy when our client actually agreed i mean it it is it is slightly more expensive than your traditional forms of architecture uh but we were very happy when our client actually uh, you know wanted to join us on this uh you know this entire experience of uh trying to explore a new way of uh, and we're very happy to say that we're both very very happy with the by product and uh, we hope to have this building standing up pretty soon
but yes this is something that uh, i think as students uh, and you know coming out in the future you should start exploring please uh, start uh, you know i wouldn't say learning these softwares but you know play around with them because i think the more you play the more you learn uh, it's endless the possibilities are endless because i think it's a tool that can really really be explored well very similar to sketchup but i think it just gives you a lot more uh, you know opportunities to play with form and uh, you know in a way that you wouldn't do with sketchup so uh, yes i would encourage all of you to do that for sure uh, i think that's the last slide if i'm not wrong uh, yes yes so have fun yeah brinda uh, a small question to you in yeah. terms of uh, you know the uh, emerging softwares etc Yes. See whether you like it or not, we are hostage to the fact that uh, you know the syllabus is kind of decided by this uh, university, and there is a, a certain amount of quantum of hours to be filled in that you know doesn't leave much time for uh, exploration. So, a lot of these initiatives, if at all, in terms of learning softwares, will be something personal driven. Okay. Absolutely. So, uh, I'm like Grasshopper, uh, uh, Rhino, etc. Uh, we have a resource person. Uh, I think size. I don't know whether he's participating. He has been trying to, uh, you know, introduce this software. Yes, I think you'll have to tinker around. You'll have to learn a little bit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think to a great extent, it's a personal kind of initiative to rise up. Uh, I think uh, we are going further with. I think uh, Space Maker. I think uh, Autodesk has just bought this uh, small company. Yes. And uh, th that's going to be, I, I think, uh, a total game changer in terms of your parametric designing. Yes. There is Oculus also, I think, which is uh, 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 being used by my friends uh, abroad. We do uh, too. We've done a complete hospital project in Hyderabad where we've used uh, the entire project is on Oculus. Uh, we, hmm. we continue to have these sessions with the clients and with the, so it, it is a hospital project. So we do have a user group there. So the user group is also on the Oculus. So I think it's it's uh, uh, unfortunately I cannot show you the project or you know sort of uh, talk about it right now. But that is something our studio does as well. So all of these come under hybrid arc where we are exploring new technologies. So we think the Oculus is uh, something that is going to absolutely like you rightly say it's going to be a complete game changer. It is the future. I mean it's already there in 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 I think other parameters. But it's definitely making an it making its way into our industry, and I think that's it's a huge plus. Which is where I think the students need to have the ability to go in there and model. I mean, can you imagine going into a parametrically designed space and then experiencing it on the Oculus? I think I think the possibilities are uh, are you know immense. A little personal question now. Yes. Uh, um, when you're driving a business, when you're managing your office, when you're driving the so many other things that need to be run as, as the principals, as the partners, etc. How much of time can you invest in learning softwares, which, which, is, which is the future? So how much of softwares would you as a person know, uh, as in your, or are you using external resources or, uh, you know, friend, uh, you know, employees to run this? See, I'll tell you. Uh, so, if, if if you look at uh, my resume and, and and I think all my partners, uh, we've all well, most of us have actually done uh, uh, programs where we actually did a program. Two of two of us have at least done digital architecture programs, and I think it was. So, I can speak for myself. Uh, why why did I choose to do those two programs? I mean, so for me, and I think this is this might help some of the students who are considering, you know, for the studies or the or a master's program. Please don't pick a place, pick a school or a program because of where it is located or because you want to or because someone told you about it. I think each one of us is an individual. We each have our strengths. So I think you need to know what you want out of that program. So please study the program. Reach out to the professors. They're all extremely happy to hear from you. I, my, my personal way of working with it would be to pick a professor someone who interests you, someone whose studio interests you, you can write out to them, reach out to them, ask them about what their program is, what does the program entail. Not just, don't just say what is, what is the software that you use, what is the studio? See, look, when you go in for a master's program, I think it's more about what you take away from the program as much as what you give to the program, right? That's what makes a master's program successful. So unless you are able to give as much as they're able to give you, that conversation is not going to be you know, a fruitful one. So uh, I would encourage anyone who's looking at a master's program to start studying it now. Um, and then going back to, like you said, you know, how much time do you have? 
So even though I did two did two programs that were uh, digital design, uh, I didn't have a, th a class that where they taught me how to use the software. I had to stay back after hours and I had to learn to use the software, which is when I, which is why I said, all of you, I think there are student versions of every single software. So please get in there, use your IDs, download the student version, and explore. I personally am not a big fan of students going into uh, you know like a a studio or one of those classes where they teach you because they can only teach you how the computer works or how a command works and i would rather they explore themselves so like i said take a part she draw something absolutely out of the world like something that nobody could even think of drawing and then get into the system and figure out how to draw it because that way you will have a better understanding of how the command works and how the software works much better than somebody who's a trainer in you know one of those centers who's able to teach you they they're limited in what they can teach you because they're not in your brain trying to figure out the space that you're trying to create so to answer you uh most of the, i'm self-taught for the most part uh, including Auto, I think Autodesk. Uh, in all fairness, I think Aurobindo remind me. I think we did have a, an Autodesk class in school. I think, uh, but for yeah. all parametric modeling, uh, all self-taught. Uh, I did not attend any classes. Uh, I still dabble with them. Uh, I still love to go into SketchUp and model and go into all my other softwares and model. Uh, and we have a couple of softwares that we actually dabble with. Each of us actually works with a different uh, software. Uh, so we go in there, we model, like I said, you know, sometimes we look at a building and we, you know, there have been cases where we model something in a software and then we come to a point and we're stuck uh, because that, that software doesn't help us get the results that we want. So then what we do is we move to the next one. So every software, like I said, works very differently. Like some models are very easy to explore and build in SketchUp. Some are very easy to do in Revit. Uh, so I think it's, it's more about how uh, proficient you are with, uh, the software, your software's uh, working skills. And I think it's also the design. Some designs just are much easier to work in a particular software. And I think that will only come you know, as trial and error. So yes, we started and we've reached a point and we've had to step back. And I think there's nothing wrong with it. You take a step back, you know, like I said, you zoom in, zoom out. You, you, know, you, you review where you are and we feel like we're not getting the res desired results. We move platforms, we move to the next one and we start exploring again. Uh, so all of you should definitely do that on the side. Uh, Sir, I understand what you're saying about time. Yes, it is a constraint. But I think if you're, again, you know, like I said, passionate, if you're passionate and it's something that you really are, you know, keen to learn, I think you will find the time to do it. Um, and yes, just sir. spend 10 minutes on it. Yeah, small question, another question as a follow up to that. Yeah. Um, see, uh, we, we all, um, um, uh, you know, uh, started initially with a you know a drawing board, pencil, and uh, set squares and that kind of thing. And uh, eventually, over the uh, period of time, we have gone into uh, uh, 2D drafting and such other things. And of course, we have come to SketchUp now. Now, uh, whether we liked it or not, that uh, transition had to happen, and it has happened. Now, what would you say are those essentials? Say for the next five years, if you do not uh, you not commit and uh, master it. Uh, say you are a terrible disadvantage. What are the soft ways are a must learn for students or even practitioners for this point of time? I'm talking about things like uh, there is Revit there. That we are talking about Bentley as a, a BIM yeah. modeling software. Yeah, that's what something those, I worked on. Yes. Yeah. What are this? Uh, what are those? Uh, you know, because there are so many things to be learned. But what are those one or two things that uh, is a must that I think. Uh, uh, to keep you current, say, another five years or 10 years? See, I, I, I think I'm going to answer that slightly differently. I think uh, let's look at it as uh, what skills you need to have. I think one you need to have is the, the basic skill of being able to design. That's, you know, ideally, if you ask me, it's up here. Uh, it's your brain, which needs to be sharp. Uh, and then you need to be able to take that and put it into a form that you can express to someone else. So. Um, I think there are different ways to do it. Uh, SketchUp is or Trimble is one of you know the the easiest ways, and you know I think one of the most useful softwares out there today, and it's okay. very easy to pick up. I think my twelve year old son, twelve year old son, models in SketchUp, and it was completely. I mean, I was taken aback at how much he had picked up on his own without. I mean, no prodding. I didn't even know he had it on his system, uh, okay. but he went in and he was building these environments and he was exploring. Which is when I said, you know, if a twelve year old can do it, I think we can all do it. Um, so SketchUp is great uh, and it's very easy to pick up. I, I know they're coming up with new add-ons and uh, you know new things that will make it a better software. Um, very easy to, to access, very easy to learn. Um, 
can also be used very well as a presentation software when we talk about concepts, concept presentations. So we do that a lot. We do that a lot for like massing. When we do, uh, say, uh, large scale uh, uh, master planning projects, we use that as a presentation model to do block models. Uh, so definitely SketchUp. Uh, another presentation software would be Photoshop. Uh, I don't think any of us can survive without it. Uh, and, I, and I'm talking only in context of um, studios that are working out of the Indian context. Uh, but when you look at it in the West, yes, there are a couple of other softwares that are out there. But I think Photoshop, your presentation package, your Microsoft package is always there. It's always the backbone. Uh, but please do spend time on Photoshop because I think, again, Photoshop is the software that's not been explored and tapped out of enough. Uh, immense possibilities in terms of presentation skills. Uh, and then uh, there's a really nice software that we use. Um, again, I don't know if it's used a lot, but we found it and we love it. It's called Squiggle, or I think Squiggle works. Uh, look it up in terms of you know concept design. But I, I'm not sure if it's. Uh, I think it's actually a free software. Uh, I, I'll have to double check on that. But it's a very fun software uh, that you know I think even your students can use can use for presentations. Uh, very very fun, very quirky. Uh, lets you explore things very quickly. Um, other than that, uh, when you go, then when you go into the modeling softwares, I think there are so many. Uh, I think, sir, to uh, address your uh, you know your question of there are so many and which ones to pick, uh, I think I think what we need to do is look at the future. Now, Bentley is something that I learned when I was in school, uh, but when I came back here, I found the trans. It, it's still an issue with uh, I think not so much with 3D Max, but with some of the other softwares where. How do you transition it to, you see, at the end of the day, it has to be a GFC set, right? It needs to go out to site. Uh, I found that Bentley as a platform was not very uh, conducive to translating it to a GFC. Uh, that was one challenge. The second challenge with Bentley was there weren't enough people who knew it. So I mean, I, I can spend time getting my, my studio and my staff to get onto the software. It's not hard to do. But then when it came into the consultants, I, it, I think it's unfair for me to expect them to want to get onto the same software. So we actually did a project where we did cross-platform. So they were doing AutoCAD and we were doing Bentley. Uh, but we just found that you know it, it might work for some projects which are not on a, very, on a fast track basis. But if you talk about projects that are time bound, which most of them are, then I think when you have a twin platform system, it, 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 it's a little overwhelming. Uh, but if you do have the time, I think they should do it. Uh, tri clock uh, moving across platforms. Um, so the, I wouldn't look at Bentley as, because Bentley, I don't think, is looking at India big time. Uh, they probably are not going to come in in a big way in India in the near future, uh, not for the next five years at least. Uh, the ones who are coming in, of course, there's Revit. Uh, I think Autodesk is going to be here to stay. Um, uh, 3ds Max, Revit, uh, like you said, I think Rhino's coming in uh, in a big way is what I'm hearing. Uh, I've seen a couple of schools that have been uh, doing it as well. So definitely, I think, look at uh, look at Rhino, look at Revit. Uh, these are things that, see, I think the way these softwares work is uh, when you look at the business aspect of it, they come in when they see there's leverage, and then they know that they can sustain themselves in the market. Like India uh -huh. is, is a new market for all of this. Uh, but these are softwares that will stick around for a bit. Uh, because you don't want to invest in learning a software and then, you know, uh, if the software is not accessible, uh, then the studios don't end up using it. Uh, yes. Having said that, I mean, I still use Bentley. So it, it doesn't mean that it's it's not a wasted uh, learning. I mean, learning, I think you learn for life. You Once you've learned it, you don't unlearn it. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it's a great asset to you. You can continue to explore in the background using your software that you have. Uh, and you, you just have to figure out how to, I think, uh, transit into another platform that everyone else is using. Uh, so yeah, I think look at... You can uh, so I think what you can do, sir, is you can uh, reach out to all of, all of these guys, and you can always ask them. You know, in terms of uh, what are their plans for the for you know Southeast Asia for now, um, okay. and they should ideally be very be very fair with you and tell you tell you if they are seriously looking at an expansion or not, uh, because I know <laughs> investing in software is is not a cheap prospect at all. So even when we invest in licenses, you know that's something that we have to consider because I don't want to get in the software that I a you know, an architect doesn't know how is not comfortable working with, or if someone's not going to be able to service it uh, for me. So I think yeah. those are conversations you you should definitely have with them, and uh, you know, and then yeah. see where it goes. Arvindo, I think you need to moderate and uh, throw open the floor now. Uh, let people ask questions. And, uh, yes. yes. I still yes. have other questions which I'll come back later. Sure. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but I think uh, you know. Uh, I think we should uh, encourage the students to ask a few questions. 
So yes. I just point them out by I just ask them out whom I know uh, will have a lot of questions. Arvind, go ahead. You ask some questions. Yeah, uh, Amal mm -hmm. has uh, sent me some questions to me. Uh, he's asking that uh, with a lot of stress on software and reach to peer work, there is something new coming up called Instagrammable architecture. So what's your thought on that? Oh, I'm not a big fan of Instagram and I don't think, uh, see, I'm, I, I don't think, um, frankly, Instagram is not here to stay. I mean, I'm not one of those proponents of Instagram at all. Um, I think you need to look at architecture that's here to stay uh, for decades and not not for an Instagram period. Because Instagram is sort of, uh, you see it and then you shut your eye and you forget it, right? I mean, that's what an Instagram story or a Facebook story is. It's, it, it is a fleeting moment. So I don't think we should aspire to be architects who want to create memories that are fleeting memories. You want to create what I you know, touched upon earlier. You want to create a legacy. You want to create a tradition. You want to create a space. You know, Sir was talking about you know, this thing, that this mosque that he's going to build in Riyadh. I mean, that is going to be a game changer. You want to aspire to create architecture that changes traditions or create, I mean, not necessarily change, redefines traditions or redefines cultures or redefines the way we live. I think that's what architecture should aspire to be. And that's what we as good designers and good creators should aspire to be. Uh, it's not It's not for today. It's not for now. It's for ideally for eternity. I know no building lasts for eternity. But the idea is that, that you create something that is timeless. So yeah, I'm not a big proponent of Instagrammable. I'm not even sure what that was, but no, I, I'm not. I'm not for it at all. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Thank you for uh, a wonderful session. Uh, so actually, my question was, uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan of Instagrammable architecture. I just read an article where uh, they said that most of the uh, big firms like MBRTV, BRK Ingalls, all these big big firms, they bring help responsible for this new trend where they're trying to just uh, uh, come up with a design that sells in the first, you know, post, within a post, so that it just sells uh, using the colors or the weird forms, so that uh, when a big, bigger firms like them, like MVRTV or, um, yeah, like uh, UN Studio, VR Kinkles, when they come up with this trend, when they set this trend, what do you think, how is it going to affect the architecture as a field entirely because of, there's uh, Instagram, social media out there, all the, at the same time, softwares. So how is this going to change the game? Or like, what do you think, like, mostly it's adverse effects? I, I, I'm really glad you're asking these questions because this is something that uh, I think over, especially I think over COVID, uh, you know, the time that all of us have spent back, you know, and just we've, we've done a little introspection when we've also studied what's going on around us. And you're absolutely right. Uh, there are, I mean, I, I don't want to name firms and I'm not pointing out, I don't want to get into the specifics of it. But yes, there are firms that are doing what is called either your uh, your magazine architecture, your magazine design, your Instagrammable design. It's true. And I think that's it, it's, it's a very individual decision. Uh, I'm not even going up to the level of, you know, the, the firms that you mentioned. I'm going to talk about some firms who are back home, back here, very well-renowned uh, firms uh, who are getting into the trap of uh, design that's meant for the glossy sheets, right? I, and I think more so what irks me is that it's being designed for people to live in. Now, I think there's a huge, now this is all, uh, mind you, this is all what my take and this is how we look at spaces. Our office designs uh, almost, I think, 80 to 90% of what we draw gets built in the office. And I, I, I don't think many firms can say that. Uh, because I think what we design is very buildable and which is what I said, like when, when I have an idea up here or when a, one of our partners has a, an idea up here, we want to make sure that we can build it. Now, I don't want to show someone an image or a picture, a beautiful picture that I don't know how to build, uh, or I don't want to give them a space that they can't live in. You, you open, I mean, there are umpteen, I think, uh, websites, uh, Instagram pages, Facebook pages that today I mean, have, have been coming up, and I think more so in the last couple of months, uh, that are showcasing these uh, projects as, uh, you know, this stellar pictures, the beautiful paintings. I mean, they, they, I have nothing against creativity, and I, and I honor and I applaud all the creativity that's being, is, 
being put out there. But I think there has to be something called uh, responsibility, which is what I spoke about, you know, right? What is responsible architecture? You have a brief, uh, and I think you're you're being given the responsibility of creating that space, whether it's a house, a home, a hospital, whatever that is. It is a space that's going to be inhibited by people. It's not going to be in the covers of a magazine for life. Now, if that space that you design looks glossy on paper, bravo. But is a person or a human being comfortable in that space? Is it a space that they can live in? Can they wake up in the morning and say, I slept peacefully or I had a restful sleep in the night? Uh, I think those are the questions that need to be answered. Uh, I think we all want to be on the covers of all pages and we all want to have these, you know, stellar, uh, uh, you know, images that, uh, you know, speak, you know, everybody's talking about and everybody's spinning on their page. I think we all want to be there because I think that's, you know, like it or not, we all want to be liked, right? Isn't that a human tendency that we want to be loved, we want to be liked, we want to see how many likes and clicks and, uh, you know, followers of our story are there. Uh, Nothing wrong with it. It's very human. But I think, it, again, like I said, go back, take a step back and remember that you have a responsibility. You are a professional, right? You have a responsibility to your client. Uh, it's not about delivering. I mean, if your client wants a book that's, I mean, I've had people come to me and said, I want a book. I want to build a house that's never been published before. I mean, I had a client who said that. And I said, I'm sorry, but that's not a brief to me. You have to be more specific and give me a brief. Like, what do you, what, tell me about yourself, right? To me. At the end of the day, the space that I design has to be a reflection of my client, the person who inhibits the space. Uh, to me, if I have achieved that, that's a good project. And that's a successful project. Uh, it doesn't matter to me if it doesn't get published. It may or may not get published. What's, what's important is that the brief has been met. Uh, it's a space that is happy. It's a space that's livable, inhabitable. And it meets all the criteria, ticks off all those boxes. Uh, I think. That that uh, you know, I'm hoping that it answers your question. But how does it? How is it changing architecture? Look again. I think it's going to be something that's as fleeting as an Instagram story, right? Uh, people are, are right now in this. You know, everybody wants to be there, and then there's this whole momentum of you know, let's get visible, let's be seen. Uh, I don't think that's. I mean, that that desire is not going to change. Uh, but will the type of architecture change? I don't think so. You may, you may all do or we may all do one or two of those projects that gets on the cover, but not every one of your projects is going to be that, right? Maybe you'll do two projects like that in a year, but that's not going to necessarily change the way architecture is perceived because at the end of the day, you are going to have a client who wants a three bed, three bedroom, three whatever, three bedroom, three toilet, kitchen, house. Someone's going to want a hospital that works. So it's not going to change. You can still have fun. Please go out, like which is why I said be young at heart. Have fun. Create. Don't stop creating. Don't stop dreaming. Dream big. But always remember, and be, you should be able to zoom out and remember what is the brief. Who is your client? Your client is not, uh, you know, those glossy magazines or Instagram. Who is your client? Your client is that person sitting across the table from you who wants that house built or that hospital built or that you know whatever you're designing. So please make sure you're at the end of the day. You're giving the, your client what he wants, uh, not a magazine. Uh, and and I really hope that you know this this trend that you rightly mentioned. Yes, it it is there. I can see that. Uh, I really hope that people see it for what it is, uh, and they realize that uh, there aren't too many people, thankfully, doing it. But there are, and like you rightly said, there are very big names who are doing it. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm assuming that it's just more, it's a question of time. It, 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 people are going to go back to doing, they will have these, you know, one of one or two fancy projects, which is great because I think we all need to be inspired and we love it. You know, we love to see creativity and we love to see these one-off projects, but there will always be your uh, uh, brick and mortar projects that will always be there. I mean, as an architect, you have to be able to be, you know, weigh the balance and be able to do both. Thanks. Uh, Amal, any more questions? OK. Uh, OK, I have another question from Sawad. Uh, what's the favorite part for you when designing, building, and the least favorite? <laughs> uh, I love, I think I'm a problem solver. I love it when there's a problem. So. Uh, 
you know someone will come to me and say oh god i i can't you know we we have it a lot so you know we'll create these spaces and they say uh, okay i have to send this drawing out to the structural engineer and he's come back with you know this bunch of columns that sort of you know just ruin everything uh, so that's when i get like the most kicked i think i enjoy solving problems so i think that's like the happiest part for me um i don't know if this uh a path that i don't like i'll really have to think about that i think probably just managing the finances and getting uh, you know my bills paid on time uh, i think things like that or just uh, i think not having uh, it very very rarely that it, that it happens i think every one of my projects has an engineer who's as equally uh, passionate and excited as we are uh, but i think if i had a team on site that wasn't uh, willing to i think explore as much as we are uh, that would sort of sort of i think uh, get us upset a little bit and we would want them to it, it it is difficult i think as engineers because i think they're not trained to dream like we are uh, you know they 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 are in that little you know with the host lines and you know this is how things are meant to be so there are times when we go into a project and you know the the engineer say no 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 it can't be done that way uh, you know it, i wouldn't say it, it upsets me uh, i again i would take it up as a challenge and actually try and educate that person and say yes it can you know you have to look outside the box and it can be reengineered uh, but i think those are the parts but otherwise i love solving problems i mean if there's a project with a problem bring it to me and i'm the happiest yeah well, so uh, sorry ma'am so as someone who has uh, who has a uh, immense experience in master planning and uh, urban planning uh, during these last few uh, uh, months architects have been asking that like, what is the future of our cities like a post covid world so what do you think because when we think about sustainable uh, cities we have been thinking about more stress on uh, uh, public transport but now can we focus that on the public transport or should we go with a wider pedestrian streets or uh, private cars because it's all going to be a complete uh, confusion uh, and uh, uh, stress on environment so what do you think is the future of a post covid city see i think uh, i think the the question you've asked is very apt but it's it's very um, i think it's more applicable to a country like ours where public transport is well i wouldn't say non existent but it's just i mean we've just begun uh, yeah and i think we're eons behind where every other country is when it comes to public uh, transport uh, but to me i think when you look about when you know when you when you go into the theories of uh, urban design and we talk about good urban design uh public transport is actually the backbone of good urban design and urban planning uh you have to plan for the masses and especially i think in a country like ours where you know our population is uh the numbers are huge it's only growing it's not going to come down you have to plan for the masses you cannot plan for the individual so the minute you start addressing and, and public transport when you talk about it it doesn't need to be just the metros it's it's how you address public spaces and that's something i think as a country we uh we've struggled to do again just because of the ratio of land available to to footfalls right uh if you look at a like a country like canada i mean uh their public transport system is beautiful and and it's so well settled for a country that's population is so small now they went in and they did their public transport way ahead of you know the population growth the growth is just starting now but their infrastructure is already in place uh how does covid affect it see i think a i think we we know about 10% of what covid is uh, let me be very frank about it i mean that's a different conversation uh, we really don't know enough i think about about what it is what it entails what are the long term effects of it and i think whatever covid is it is whether it's man made or not i think the the uh, the answer to it is it's all human based it's about how you and i learn or relearn how we do certain things uh, I, i was in a way you know i was thinking about it the other day and i think one of the most positive things about it um, was how we started giving people space you know how we go your ration line ka dukan story you go and stand in on a bank counter you know the tellers counter and there's someone breathing down your neck you go down to the airport and you're you're standing in the line to check in or you you know to you come out and there's somebody who's standing right they're not giving you space i think these are all social skills it had nothing to do with covid it had nothing to do with it has nothing to do with uh, public transport or with public infrastructure it's how humans behave so i think it it told us all that we need to step back and relook at how we 
envision our own pop you know we i i always say we all have a little bubble around us uh, you know that's your personal space uh, i think there was a huge disregard for that especially i think in smaller countries and developing countries and i think we've started to learn to respect that now hopefully we will continue to i think i think covid is more about that it's about how we as humans have developed and we've forgotten a few things uh, and how we're going to learn new things and relearn a few things that we've forgotten uh, i don't think it has anything to do with architecture yes there are certain things that will change you know uh, you know yes how office spaces are designed uh, again like i said office spaces weren't designed this way it wasn't 100 square foot per person or 150 square foot per person i mean when did we come up with this we came up with this say 5 years ago when the entire it boom happened right before that we each of us had sprawling cabins and you know i remember my father's cabin was about 30 feet by 20 feet i mean he was the only man in that entire cabin and i kept telling him you know in in my younger years when i used to go to his uh, office i was like why do you need such a large space but today in that same space you probably have like 30 people sitting now that's something that's it's a human thing right we've created that nobody else created that uh, so yes the architecture will change slightly the way we perceive it again i think it goes back to my point of us as architects being responsible uh, being professionals and this is one of those aspects of creating responsible architecture right how do you how what you do affects society I mean, I know it, it's 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 a tough line to say because that would have been the brief that you have to fit 150 people in that space. That's not the architect's prerogative to say yes or no. Uh, but we did have a hand in creating those spaces. Uh, so, how will uh, cities change? I see. I think cities changing will happen will not happen in a year or two. The human behavior changes ideally should have already started and we see that in some cities we don't see it in some cities human behavior will change now it will change immediately uh, how the cityscape will change i think we will start thinking not just in terms of covid i think we will start thinking about how humans interact so i think it's more that and which is why i said as architects i think we need to be sensitive we need to be aware and which is why i said read go out there explore understand how the world works because the space that you create uh, you know the place that you create is going to touch so many aspects of human life, uh, which is why I think it, more so as architects, you have a huge, bigger responsibility today. Uh, we've been hit by COVID tomorrow. God forbid there's something else, right? We don't know what the future holds. So yes, we can't look into the future, but you can always think ahead of the things, you know, and don't forget what we've learned. Take that learning and take it forward. Uh, and in terms of, you know, if you do get an opportunity to design a larger space, I think think about how a human being or a group of human beings would inhibit the space uh, rather than just it being pretty architecture or you know just a really nice graphic uh, on a piece of paper so i think that's that would be the learning from covid cities smaller cities uh, i don't see changing uh, i think a country like india like i said we're landlocked uh, we don't have unfortunately uh, you know that kind of land where we can sort of expand uh, maybe some of the other larger uh, continents where there is space they may look at it in, in, in a different way but they're already there i think you know which is why i spoke about things like canada and sri lanka uh, they don't have this paucity of land we do uh, so i think for us it will be we should definitely uh, go ahead and further uh, uh, strengthen our public transport system uh, and you know human beings are human beings we just have to learn uh, to live the right way and, and be responsible people uh, anjali has sent a question to me uh, just one minute sir uh, she is asking how could we as an architect deal with the issues like housing or any other basic amenities relating to the lower strata of society it sounds i mean uh, you know that's the question she is asking like you know uh, how could we as an architect uh, deal with the issues like housing or any other basic amenities uh, relating to the lower strata of society Oh, I think, I think the opportunities there are immense. Uh, again, like I said, uh, responsible architecture doesn't need to be, uh, you know, touch uh, the lives of the rich and the famous. Uh, I think more so for, uh, you know, the downtrodden. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, there is one, one of the aspects that the studio is looking at is, um, I'm not allowed to tell you the name of, uh, you know, what, what the project itself is, but it is a government initiative. Uh, low cost housing so we're actually building uh prototype houses which we hope will make the cut with you know i mean everything everything said and given you know we do have to go through the ropes of you know the government uh 
but we took it up on ourselves and this was not anything that was requested for by uh, the government or by any other body uh, it was one of our architects in the studio who actually uh, came up with this idea after one of the recent floodings and uh, he said uh, you know he was talking to one of the principals and both of them said okay let's come up with a with a modular house that uh, you know this was the orissa floods so we all know that you know bihar and orissa have these floods that you know ravage through the through them uh, almost every year i think it is every year uh, so there are these prototype houses that uh, we are currently working on in the studio uh, we are currently looking out for a vendor who will work with us uh, to help us build that first prototype um, it's a single bed kitchenette uh, unit that can be built uh, in a span of 7 uh, to 14 days uh, you know depending on the location uh, and you know the distance from the source of where the source materials are uh that's the timeline uh and easy it's like a diy like your ikea diy kits uh very very simple uh that any carpenter or any construction team can put up in a span of two weeks uh the idea is that you are able to rehome them uh you know yes there's one aspect of it is prevention but i think that's that's a bigger battle to be won uh the smaller battle is how do you rehome them when these you know calamities do strike uh, we don't want them sleeping on the streets uh you know i mean there are, there are some horrible stories out there uh so these the, the idea was to come up with this thing that uh, i mean it's not just i think the orissa floods it can be used in any context wherever there is this need for emergency housing it can it can comfortably seat uh, i mean or uh, you know house a full family uh, you know husband wife uh, aged parents uh, there are modules where there's uh four people there's modules where there's six people uh but it is a modular product um so we and we are constantly in touch with uh you know certain government authorities on how this can be implemented um so that's just one way i think that uh, we as a studio decided to sort of you know look at that aspect i think there are so many ways as students uh, so one of the things you know going back to what my experience was uh um kappa so uh, what did kappa do as a student i was uh, i was studying i was living in chicago in downtown and where the university is there are some areas which did have you know housing uh, in fact i lived i think in the middle of one of the housing projects uh, so it really intrigued me as to how they live and why they live the way they live uh, so i went in and i uh, you know volunteered and i i got a job at kappa and i was working so gary if you look it up gary indiana is uh, one of the scariest places on the planet i think uh, and my parents were up in arms when i told them that i was going out to work there uh, but it was something that i wanted to experience first hand to understand why these people live the way they live uh, a very uh, interesting eye opening experience um, uh, look it up if you can uh, i don't think the place has changed uh, exponentially uh, it is still a very very uh, very poor uh, and a very uh, backward community uh, but what kappa did and what you know my professor and i decided to do was look at it in terms of how uh, we can make it a be better living space without Uh, so you have to understand that these people don't like to be displaced uh, it is their identity uh, and it's not our place to give them a new identity or to rehome them you know to move them out and displace them so we the, the, the entire exercise was how do you make it a better living space give them better living conditions given what they already have uh, so that's what it was it was an urban revival project um, and i think i learned a lot uh, not just about the human psyche but i think how economics works Uh, how as an as a designer or as an architect uh, you design spaces public spaces uh, private spaces more responsibly and especially i think in a condition like that um, so we are, you know the hope is that some of my learning from there i will be able to implement uh, in one of these uh, project uh, in in time uh, but there are many ways uh, I, i mean there are many institutions like that many ngos who are out there so you guys can get in there uh, join them up help them out uh reach out to them see how you can help as architects so yeah there is a lot of okay uh next question i have is this is uh, from sawad uh what skill has served you best in your architectural career uh when you say skill you mean like a technical skill or like a human skill like what, mm. which skill would that be because i think uh, i think It's not specified it so i mean let's take it i mean uh, you know in a technical uh, um i think just my problem solving skill and uh, and i think uh, yeah i think it would be problem solving to be able to look at something and to be you know i kept saying that zoom in zoom out uh, it's something that 
I think I've learned to do over a period of time. Uh, it wasn't a skill that I had initially. Um, so to be able to be able to look at a problem, you know, at different scales, because sometimes you will not find the answer uh, at a particular level. You might need to look at it from a different perspective, uh, and then the solution is sort of obvious. So that pause has to happen. So I think I've learned how to do that, and I think that's something that I I, I think I can appreciate now. Uh, as a person or as an interpersonal skill, um, yeah, I guess the for point number one, you know, to be passionate and to not be scared to dream. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not talking about going crazy, uh, but I'm I am extremely passionate about everything that I do. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, I'm passionate about dogs. I'm passionate about animals. I'm passionate about design. I'm passionate about colors. So I think passion as an interpersonal as a personal skill and uh, definitely being able to solve a problem and not get bogged down by it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have another question. This is from Varshini. Uh, she's in third year. Uh, question is, uh, this is regarding the Nama Metro. Uh -huh. So what were the challenges that occurred while designing or constructing the metro station? Oh, many. Oh, my God. I think... Uh, the first I thing I will tell, they didn't pay you. <laughs> Sorry? They didn't pay you. First thing no, I know, they, they didn't pay you. <laughs> you know that, yes. I think yes. we talked about this earlier. Uh, but that's that was like the smallest of uh, our problems. Oh, they were immense. Uh, consider this. I mean, I I I just moved back after working uh, on similar projects in the UK and the UAE, where uh, you know uh, the DDC is God. DDC here means Des Detail Design Consultant or Design Consultant. So uh, there, I was God. Like you know, anything I said was the Bible, and and meaning they. They valued your input. They valued what you had to say. And then I come back here and I get this really lovely invitation. And then I get into an, into an interview with uh, the big wigs and the bureaucracy. And, and I meet the chief minister. And they're all like, yes, yes, yes. You know, we want this beautiful body of people to come together and help us realize this dream for the city. And I was so excited that I could give something back to the city that I was born in. Uh, so got into it. Uh, I think the biggest challenge was being able to uh make them see things the way that we did see bureaucrats i think are i mean nothing against them but they're just trained to see things differently uh and i think we are trained to see things differently and and then there was just not the bureaucrats then you know you have of course there were a couple of other bodies that are not allowed to mention uh but again the government bodies and I understand that there is an agenda and I understand there is a budget and I understand there are many other levels of society involved. Uh, but I, I think the biggest challenge was for all of us to sit across the table and come to consensus and for them to be, and, and for me as being a responsible architect, uh, to be able to convey my message to them in a way that they understood it. Uh, because what I valued, say, there was a particular fenestration or a particular detail to the roof that you know I want not I wanted to do that I thought was the best you know solution uh, wasn't received the same way say X Y Z uh, you know the forms that you see didn't happen overnight oh the, we've had multiple sessions there was arguing there was paper throwing everything involved uh, to get them to understand. Uh, and I think because of all our persuasion, they actually made a trip down to Dubai to see the Dubai Metro. We can see to be able to understand that the Metro doesn't have to be a box. And then they're not spending, uh, you know, claimed 10 times the amount of the budget to build a shape that was not a rectangle. So, I mean, there were, there were so many wars that had to be fought at so many levels. The number of presentations I had to do to convince somebody for a simple thing as, you know, a light box or, uh, say, a railing design. Uh, but I think when I talk about all of this today in hindsight, I mean, I'm smiling and laughing today. Uh, I think all the white hairs were from the Metro project, not anything else. Uh, I think resilience is something that I picked up from that project. Uh, to not give up on my dream, uh, I would fight it tooth and nail. Uh, if I wanted a particular stone, I would go back there and I would keep going back with the same sample and I would keep going back you know, with, the, with another vendor who came down with a better price. Uh, I think to persevere on what I thought was right. I think that's something that I learned. And I think that's important when you are in a uh, project or in a situation that's difficult, uh, you should be able to take something out of it. So you should come out of it victorious. Maybe you may not get the project or you may not. I mean, like, like I said, I don't think the end product is what 
we would have envisioned it to be. Uh, it's it's about I think fifty percent of what I wanted the building to be. Uh, why was the other fifty not there, or why is it not there? Many reasons. I think one is budget. Two is the lack of technical skill. Uh, people weren't aren't skilled enough to detail the way we wanted them to detail. Uh, I mean, so many more that I don't even want to touch upon. Uh, but I think getting fifty percent there, I'm happy because I think I was able to change the mindset of so many people. From what like rights? So rights was uh, rights is your railways, basically Indian railways, uh, all headed by fifty, sixty, seventy year old gentlemen who've been there forever and they know what a train looks like, they know what railway tracks look like, and they know what a train station is. So my, they, so I had this gentleman ask me. He said, "You're designing nothing but a glorified railway station. So why should I let you, you know, spend X, Y, Z?" So it's it was that mindset that needed to be changed because. you know like the earlier conversation we had we're designing for the future right uh, so why should we not let everything that we do be future positive uh, you know and look forward why does it need to be regressive so i think the biggest uh, you know contribution that was there was not just putting these structures up i think it was trying to change the mindset of the group of people on what what the city should look like and i think we have miles to go uh there's still a lot to be achieved in terms of how you know the public architecture is perceived and you know public spaces are conceived uh i'm unfortunately not working with them anymore uh but i do hope that you know everything that you know the conversations we've had and the contributions we've given to them uh they will take that on board and you know continue as they expand uh, through the different phases of metro uh i have a last i have another question i think we'll take this as the last question yeah. we have been talking for a very long time uh Uh, this is from anjali uh, fifth year she is asking sometimes while solving a problem we end up creating another unnecessary problem so what's your advice on this see i don't think uh, i think the word unnecessary uh, doesn't apply i think most of the times when we go to solve something the by product is always either a smaller or a bigger problem I, ideally it should be a smaller one uh, and most of the times it is uh i don't think we should look at it as a problem i think you know it goes back to physics every action has a reaction right so look at it like that uh and i think this is where your skill comes to be able to be able to look at it don't look at it as a problem look at it as a challenge that's the first thing uh because then i think when your the attitude towards it is positive you you approach it differently uh and the second thing is i think being able to look at it from a different perspective uh and i mean there are days when i would probably uh you know i'm working on something the whole day and i and i'm not able to solve it uh i might put it away and i might come back to it in a day or two when you know my mind is clearer and and i look at it with a fresh pair of eyes and i actually realize that it wasn't a problem at all uh, i was just looking at it the wrong way uh so i think that's and i think it's a very human skill i think we should do that with life as well not just architecture but when you're designing it, i think it's very easy to get cornered which is again i'm going back you know i may sound like a stuck record but my studio says this all the time i hammer them down on the pencil please pick up your pencil and draw keep a grid book keep a butter paper whatever you want to draw so what i found is the easiest way to solve a problem is to let your head and your hand do the thinking uh draw out what you think is that situation or sketch it out or if it is something that's uh, not architecture related it's in your life right so i think when you do that when you use your your hand and your head you know when they connect i think you'll find the solution or at least it just gets clearer for you so if we, if it is architecture related print it out draw it out sketch it out please keep all of you invest in a grid book or in a butter sheet you know whatever you like to sketch on craft book i think there are so many options out there today please draw uh, you know we were doing this with uh, just a couple of days ago i think so we 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 were stuck with detailing something and then we took the grid book out and we started to draw and we automatically found the solution i mean we were just looking at it wrong because i mean i have nothing against autodesk or autocad but i have to go back to what mr berry said that you know i and i'm if any of my studio you know studio people are here they will tell you i i say this all the time like come out of the computer the computer can't think for you you are supposed to do the thinking it's a tool that's there to help you please don't let, let the computer design for you please don't let the computer do the thinking for you 
it's not going to do it for you so start drawing start sketching and you know the second problem that you thought may not even be a problem and even if it is you will solve it uh, because you 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 slow down your brain slows down and you're able to solve it so yeah try that hopefully that helps uh thanks brinda uh you've been talking a lot and the time is also over so we'll just uh, close up now for today's session i would like to thank our chairman uh mr said mohammed beri our principal ashok mendonka our hod uh, architect rupsana all the faculty student guests guest speakers and especially uh, Anna, uh architect anan and architect uh, brinda for making it a uh, success today uh, i would ask uh, architect ashok mendonka to say a few words thank you arvindo i think we um, when we decided to have a session the uh, primary motive was that uh, we need to give the benefit uh, to our students um, and also faculty um, a certain kind of insights from external resources uh, and in that we got the right people um, ananda you know i met him 5 years back uh that, that's the only time i met him and uh, we met him uh, after the post inauguration i think we exchanged a few sentences you know uh, words over lunch or something like that kind but what i saw in him then i said we need to get this back and uh, get uh, anand back here and uh, you know when other than the fact that you know when the students that joined with them were actually graduating so i thought it uh, had some kind of meaning um so the whole exercise was meant to uh, give kind of uh, insight to uh, both students as well as the faculty and i think we have got excellent resources uh, today for our session um to revisit what what has happened today yes i am uh, i will also like to open uh, openly speak a certain amount of disappointment from my side in terms of Uh, you know the, the not the fullest we are already a small group of people here and uh, we did not see the full participation especially the from the graduating uh, uh, batch which i mean it life life is a lifelong you know the thing of learning uh, you know you listen to people you hear uh, uh, you know new voices there is something to carry home always so every time we lose our uh, lose an opportunity like that we lose something so i think in that sense i am a little bit disappointed because uh, i know uh, the effort uh, uh, arvind has put in the team has put in, in um, you know uh, making this happen um yes i also um, yeah i need to thank uh, um uh, our chairman uh, sayed bari sir for uh, being very expressive and uh, saying things as they are and uh, a passion is Uh, i think important irrespective of what line you are success can whether you are a chef or whether you are a doctor or whether you are a architect i think certain amount of application has to go in yes that is our part of the you know, you know uh, kind of a contribution the results sometimes uh, most of the time they, they might happen sometimes they don't happen but that doesn't mean that you stop working on this um to capture what uh, anand has said um he spoken a lot of things uh, and one of the things is um, going back revisiting his uh, um, you know background um this a whole set of experiences that he brought uh, and uh, also the message to the faculty that we as faculty are not friends of students we are not here for friendship basically we have got a job to perform and i think uh, We, I, I remember my professor, Professor Muhammad Chair, telling us in the studio the same thing. He said, uh, uh, "In this class, we are not friends. But once you graduate, and when you are colleagues, when you are, you know, uh, professionals, uh, we can be friends." So I think that equation uh, needs to be understood uh, both by students as well as the faculty. Um, um, and uh, coming back to um, Brinda. she kept saying that uh, we architects are dreamers now um it is actually uh, if you take it at a superficial level um 
the dreams what she means is got a lot of things embedded in that it requires a kind of a passion it requires patience it requires a whole lot of uh, uh, you know uh, the communication skills that are required the kind of persuasion that you need to make a project your so called creation or uh, to bring it into existence it requires that kind of persistent prolonged kind of application for it actually to be realized an artist who is a dreamer could do something and just pin it up on the wall but an architect's um, uh, um, you know kind of uh, art is something it has got lot of uh, joys it's got many highs it has got many lows there is lot of disappointments in not seeing what you wanted to actually happen there are economics there are time pressures there are work skill limitations so this um, um, this requires is more of a marathon race than a 100 meter sprint uh, our line so that's why that's why it makes more sense to hear out um, you know people out there uh, our seniors listen to them uh, try to capture uh, get you know get uh, inspiration from them and also understand that it is not a straight you know a 100 meter dash there it's it's, it's, it's it's much little more complicated than that yes with this i thank everyone um uh, i uh, for making this a success and i think i uh, see um uh, uh, sayed sir also present for this uh, uh, valedictory um I, i would like him to share a few um, thoughts on this uh, before we close for the day thank you thank you everyone hello am i audible yes sir we can hear you sir thank god thank god because i need to convey some important message after listening to both uh, uh, our uh, you know anand and uh, brinda uh, even though what happened is there no i don't confess now leave it at that okay sir uh, once again uh, anand amazing uh, presentation you know straight from the heart and uh, you know when i see those uh, the design the detailing it is like god is in detail so that i could see from the turkish work and uh, in brinda i saw a lot of uh, cross section of the work i saw it is not that i i been watching you very closely i was doing my work and on and off i put you on mute and i was just looking at the screen with that i was trying to make uh, trying to you know make both ends meet and trying to read between the words between the other pictures uh two three aspect i want to tell our uh, the ashok and uh, the faculty member you see this is a whole day session there's a lot of uh, uh, time money and an energy maybe money may be less but then the time and energy is a whole lot for the entire uh, you started at 9 o'clock and now it is 4 o'clock so it is uh, you know such a long period but the participant were less than 50 so my suggestion is this kind of a wonderful session should not be limited to beat salon you know imparting education should not be leads to in that limited manner it should go to everyone so my request is next time whenever you are having a program like this you know send this message because the moment it is a uh, the moment it is a you know google class then it is a uh, you know in a public domain anyway even otherwise so then why you restrict so let let the people you know understand you know and uh, out of the 100 who 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 are watching this if one get ignited in that you know not necessary they have, they have to be a beats uh, student they can be some other students they can be some other faculty member you know then our salvation is done so i want this should not be restricted to beats and uh, you know bats you should be always in a public platform you know more the merry that is one aspect number two aspect you see you said i heard in between i think uh, arvind mentioned by annual in the days of pandemic there is nothing by annual my friend i am here today tomorrow i may not be there so it should be in a more a faster sequency so i my suggestion to make it something like virtual learning forum you know beats and bat together to start a virtual learning forum and that should happen more often 
minimum in a month. Once in a month is must. You know, if possible, twice in a month. You know, and call for different uh, architects and don't limit yourself to architect alone. You know, invite uh, musician. You know, invite artist. Invite doctors. Invite NGOs. Invite business people. You know, the developer, concerned, committed developer. I'm not saying like me. There are many are there. You know, so and uh, then you interact with those people. Call COA member. You know, so call those old architects. You know, who are worked for 30, 40, 50 years. You know, so and then make a juggle bandhi between them and the young architects who have just come out, and see their thought process, how it is qualitatively and quantitatively changed. You know, that is important. So we must do this virtual learning forum. And uh, finally, you know, to for whatever you know we 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 learned and we understood, I think there are three things that are very important for every one of us. In that, Brinda has mentioned about first is a patience. It is a patience. Second is a perseverance. Perseverance is such that you know leave no stone unturned till we reach our goal. Come what may. So it is a patient. Perseverance and finally the passion. Thank you very much. Thank you once again, Anand. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brinda. Thank you, Ashok. Thank you, uh, Arbindo. Thank you, Roxana. And these are the people I can read here. And there are all the students who have participated today. And uh, you know, God bless. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, Brinda. Bye. Thank, thank you. Can you. we sign off? Yes, please. Yes. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mendoza. Thank you, everyone. Good day. We'll be in touch. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.